I apologize again for um, going over time last time and for getting started late. We are going to talk about action potentials just a bit more today. We are in the process of simulating the propagation of an action potential along a squid axon. And uh, somebody asked, how come it looks backward? And the answer is that when you're sitting watching an action potential, uh, a wave, uh, which is asymmetric, it looks backward. If you're watching from right to left, but if you were watching from left to right, it looked fine. So let's move on now to an interesting topic, which is the enormous variation in the shapes and kinds of action potentials caused by the enormous variation in the kinds of voltage gated channels. Here, for instance, is a heart. And how many of you have taken the physiology course here at Caltech taught by Chase Lydell? One of you, two of you. OK, well, uh, Chase will tell you all about this wonderful topic of cardiac electrophysiology. And I can assure you that um, by the time you get to my age, or actually much younger, uh, you may or may not have had an, an electroencephalogram or deep, and I hope that you will not have had deep brain stimulation or brain surgery, but everybody will have had an electrocardiogram. And so uh, this is a topic that is extremely well researched among cardiologists and among um, electrophysiologists. And we see here the chambers of the heart and the various nodes of the heart. There's the sinoatrial node, which is located between the sinus and the atrium, the atrium, the atrioventricular node, which is located between the atrium and the ventricle. Uh, the Purkinje fibers. Who discovered the Purkinje fibers? Good, good. And the endocardial fibers, and midmyocardial, and the epicardium. So the action potential as it progresses from the top to the bottom of the heart changes its waveform. Those waveforms actually have significant benefit, selective advantage for the function of the various regions of the heart. You can see here at the sinoatrial node, which is a pacemaker organ, the waveform looks as though it's getting ready to fire another spike here, and indeed it is. Uh, and likewise, at the atrioventricular node, there is also a pacemaker endogenous firing. That's not true in most of the ve left ventricle, which um, generates the major force. The left ventricle needs to be triggered by the atrioventricular node. So, uh, the left ventricle pumps against the greatest resistance, and therefore it has the thickest walls, and therefore its integrated currents are largest, and therefore it contributes most of the electrocardiogram. Now, to give you an idea of the per pervasive power of Ohm's law in the activity of not only the nervous system, but the rest of the body, we're going to put up one of these equivalent circuits again with the macroscopic sodium conductance and the macroscopic potassium conductance and chloride conductance and the capacitance. Now these, even though there are two of these equivalent circuits, those are not little gammas, those are not little uh, ion channels. They are in fact just different regions of the heart. Uh, and uh, so because they are in different regions of the heart, one of the things that can happen is that current flows into one region and out another, still uh, preserving charge, but having a complete circuit. Now, uh, it turns out that to first approximation, and so the current flows uh, previously, we said, well, actually, there isn't much resistance in the extracellular medium since it's uh, salt water, and there isn't much resistance in the intracellular medium since it too is salt water. But actually there is enough resistance so that when current flows from one region of the heart to another, there's a little resistor there, see R external, 
current flowing ac across a resistor produces a voltage drop equal to the current times the resistance. And so if you have electrodes near the heart, you can record that voltage drop. And in fact, near the heart in the body means practically anywhere on the body. And so you can yourself take a electrode in one hand, a graphite pencil would be fine. And in the other hand, put it through a sensitive amplifier and watch the heartbeat, which is a couple of millivolts. You can get iPhone apps to do this. Uh, so uh, you can record the electrocardiogram. And as it turns out, um, we will describe later that the actual currents which flow during the heartbeat are rather small. But at certain points in the heartbeat, the rate of change of voltage is very large. And so what we did last time, which was to forget about the capacitive currents because the rate of change uh, occurred, because the large changes occurred very briefly, actually is large enough so that the dominant currents recorded by the EKG, by your iPhone app, I promise to get one of those for next year, are C dV by dt. So an extracellular electrode pair records IR drops proportional to the first derivative of the membrane potential. Now, I'm a little confused, and no, no cardiac physiologist has been able to tell me why the currents are proportional not to the actual first derivative, but to the absolute value of the first derivative. And I remain confused about that, but it's true. So if we look at the small fraction of the resistance between two electrodes, for instance, the chest and the limb, the voltages that we remember are a thousand times smaller than the transmembrane potential, but we can measure them anyway. So these are small resistances that we are way far away from the current sources, but you can measure them anyway. And so let's look at the electrocardiogram. Here is the action potential that you might measure in the, in the ventricle with an intracellular electrode. Now, one of the fascinating aspects of the heartbeat is that it, the action potential associated with the heartbeat is a good fraction of a second, about half a second. So that's much longer than the action potential associated with a nerve, which is about a millisecond. And in fact, the heart contracts for about half a second, then let's go contracts again. And so these action potentials last for about half a second, but the rate of greatest, the points of greatest change are the upstroke and part of the downstroke. And sure enough, the first derivative of this guy up here is this guy down here, which is the electrocardiogram, except for this annoying absolute value that I don't understand. And so if you get one of these iPhone apps, it'll look like this. And you will be recording your own EKG or ECG. So here, the upstroke is because the sodium channels are conducting rapidly, uh, giving the upstroke of the action potential. And then, as we learned last time, we return to the resting potential because the potassium channels are conducting. Outward currents here, inward currents here, and we get the EKG. And uh, the at the beginning of the 20th century, when the EKG was first recorded, uh, using really cute instruments back there. Um, people didn't know what to call all these waves, so they started in the middle of the alphabet and called them the P, Q, R, S, and T waves, and that has stuck. <laughs> so it won't help for me to ask you who discovered the P wave. Uh, okay, so one of the most common anomalies in a heartbeat is depression between the S and the T waves called ST depression, and it implies that additional current flows between sections of the heart during the plateau, which means that the heart is using more energy and it's sometimes not a good thing. But because the EKG is so far removed from the actual events in the heart, this is just an indicator, not a predictor of heart trouble. 
Okay, so what did we learn last time? We learned that the frequency of impulses of action potentials represents signaling among cells in the nervous system from sense organs to the brain, within the brain, from the brain to muscles, even in a muscle or in the heart, and in fact, even in the pancreas, even that organ that releases insulin is doing so under the command of voltage changes that look a lot like action potentials. So why do we call these action potentials, not impulses? Well, this is a, has historic reasons. Um, for many years, up until sort of the middle of the 20th century, scientists believed that there was a resting, that believed in the Nernst potential, believed in the Nernst potential, the resting potential. Uh, and then when the first blips were recorded in a sensory organ in the 20s, people said, oh, there's not only a resting potential, but there are also blips, and therefore we'll call them action potentials. And the resting potential was measured several decades and explained several decades before the action potential. So instead of calling this stylized thing an impulse, which is what it an engineer or a physicist would call it. Physiologists proudly called it when they first measured it an action potential. Okay, um, now let's have a quiz. Right. So we do quizzes, I do quizzes a little bit differently from the way Ralph does quizzes. Um, For one thing, lecture 4A, I can't find the quiz. Yeah, all right, well, uh, TAs, while I'm looking for the quiz, would you hand out the cards, please? One per person, Jaren. If not, 